The scripture reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. It can be found on page 839 in the Black Bibles. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and, the sea, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The word of the Lord. Thanks, Ozzy and Rebecca, so much. And Anna, thank you as well. Beautiful and very worshipful. And uh, welcome. Glad y'all are here. And let me pray for us now as we look into this uh, well-known in some ways, but also uh, super rich. We'll never plumb the depths of it this morning. Uh, I tried in the first hour, and we're like 15 minutes over, but I'm just kidding. Uh, I'll do my best. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, the fact that we are wonderfully made in your image, Father, and that you are with us. And we pray that as we look into this amazing story that you are at, Jesus, uh, that we would experience your power and live without fear. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a really good friend who's a pastor in Chicago. His name's Aaron Baker. He's a pastor of a church in downtown Chicago. And he preached a sermon on this passage one time that was really impactful to me. And so a lot of the insights uh, from this sermon I remember from him, including uh, this story. Aaron and his family live in downtown Chicago. And so one evening he and his wife were on a date downtown. And you know how downtown restaurants in Chicago or New York or even like, you know, as you get into Midtown or, or, or Montrose, the they're going to be in small spaces, and so the tables are real close together. So you're wanting to have a date with, you know, your wife, but somebody's sitting there, and if your elbows are too, you know, too loose, you're going to knock somebody's water over. It was one of those places, you know. And so they were talking, he and his wife, and in came another couple. They were older than them. He's about my age, so they're probably in their mid-50s. And as much as they tried, they were, you know, hoping not to eavesdrop on them really hard when the tables are that close together, uh, but then they kind of started to eavesdrop on them because it got interesting, because it became clear that this man and this woman were on a first date, and even though they were in their mid-50s, they acted like, you know, 15-year-olds at getting yogurt, you know, at the yogurt store. They were just trying to, they were trying to be witty but not overconfident, you know, and they were trying to be smart but not arrogant. It's exhausting, you know, that whole thing. They were doing that thing. It's tiring. And so they get the kind of, you know, preliminaries out of the way, and then just, they jump in to the deep end, 20 feet. They start talking about politics. My friend wanted to reach across the table, and he could have, and grab this guy by the collar and say, are you crazy? It's too soon. But they made it through politics unscathed, and then they turned to the other subject that you're not supposed to talk about on a first date, and that subject is religion. And again, they jumped right in, and my friend was like, politics and religion? Like, in fight, are y'all crazy? But, you know, at this point, they were kind of getting tired of eavesdropping, and so they went back to their own meal and their own date until my friend heard these words. When the aliens come to take over the world, you tend to perk up, you know, when you hear that. When the aliens come to take over the world, I'm going to be so embarrassed that religion still exists. And then they kept talking, and it became clear that this man at the other table wasn't really embarrassed about religion in general. He had some level of, you know, okayness for some religion. He was really embarrassed about Christianity in particular. So when the aliens come, I'm going to be so embarrassed that Christianity 
exists because those aliens, when they come, are going to, to laugh at those of us on earth that believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead on that first Easter morning. And this man's going to be embarrassed about that because he values the opinion of the aliens. It's a true story. Now, what's interesting about this, other than that, is that my friend had this massive visceral reaction to this happening at the table next to him. It wasn't that he was amused by it or bemused by it. He got angry. And he really wanted to engage this man. He wanted to stand up and he wanted to say, Oh yeah? You're going to be embarrassed at the abolition of slavery? You like that, don't you? Well, Christians did that. You're telling me that you're going to be embarrassed by the civil rights movement. I bet you like that. Christians did that. And what if one of these aliens happens to land in Houston and they have a heart attack? Well, don't you know that they'll probably go to St. Luke's or to Methodist and one of the best heart surgeons in the entire world that reside there? You know who did that? Christians. They did that. That's what he wanted to say. But then he thought, why am I so angry at this man? And why do you and I get angry at those kinds of things. Why do we react that way? Well, I think there's one, a one word answer to that, and that one word is fear. You see, just like the man at the table next to him did not want to be embarrassed when the aliens came back, my friend really didn't want to be embarrassed about this man, in, in, in the presence of this man who was thinking about the aliens. It's all about fear. Fear. I get it. Because I live like that sometimes, and I I bet you live like that sometimes too. But there is good news, and you don't really have to worry, because when the aliens come to take over the earth, you know what they're going to find? They're going to find people from every tribe, nation, and language under heaven gathering around the throne of grace, worshiping Jesus. Why? The church is going to exist, and the church is going to persist, and the reason for that is that the church is created and sustained by the power of God, not by our power, and so we don't have to live in fear. And that's the heart of the story. The power of God, our fear, and faith. It's really a story about fear and faith. I mean, think about it for just a second. If I had to choose, if I was forced, if somebody handcuffed me and tied me to a chair and said, you must choose one word, just one word that characterizes the pervasive motivating force in our country and in our culture right now. One word, what's that word going to be? And the word that I would choose would be fear. What so often drives us as parents? Fear. What drives our divided and divisive political culture in our country right now? Fear. What drives um, our, our, our com- competition among Christians in the city of Houston right now? Fear. What drives the worst fights that you have ever had with your husband or your wife or one of your children? Fear. But good news. The fact of the matter is that you and I largely are fear-driven people. That's just a fact. But we're in good company. We're in the company of Jesus' disciples. In fact, the disciples are afraid in this story. But here's the thing. This is the part. We know that they're afraid when they think they're going to die because there's a storm. But what does the text actually say? The text actually says that the time that the disciples are most afraid in this story is not when they think they're going to die. It's when the water is still and the wind is calm and nothing is happening. It is at that point when they say they trembled and feared with a great fear. You see, sometimes we're afraid when it looks like God is not going to show up. And sometimes we're afraid when God shows up. Because when he does, he tends to ask us hard questions. And he asks us too, by way of the disciples in this story, he asks us two hard questions. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? 
fear and faith lie at the heart of this story. So let's ask these questions. Why are you? Why am I? Why are we so afraid? Well, why were the disciples afraid? I mean, the text begins with Jesus saying, let us go over to the other side. Now, the other side is the other side of the Sea of Galilee. This is the part of Jesus' ministry. where Home base was a city in Galilee, north of Jerusalem, which is called Capernaum. And Jesus, I think, was, well, we know, Jesus was tired. And so he wanted to get into a boat. He wanted to go to the other side of the sea. He wanted to take a little bit of a break. So let's go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, a couple of other details we learn here that are significant. One is this. It was nighttime. They were trying to escape unnoticed. But second, it didn't work. They were not alone. Other boats were with them. It's like the paparazzi saw them getting into this boat in the middle of the night. And they said, Jesus and his disciples are getting in the boat. Let's go. You know, and so all these other people pile into all these other fishing boats. And there's this little party, you know, trudging across the Sea of Galilee in the middle of the night. So there's a lot going on here. One of those things is this. The other side of the Sea of Galilee is non-Jewish territory. It was going to a place that none of the people that were in that party would have been from, and none of the people that were in that party under normal circumstances would go to. It was not safe. It felt very dangerous. It wasn't comfortable. They didn't really know it. It was the place of the unknown. And they were on the sea in the dark in the middle of the night. Now, biblical symbolism abounds in just that one or two verses in Mark chapter 4. Mark doesn't want us to miss it. You see, in the Old Testament, the sea is a place of danger. Hidden dangers lurk beneath the surface of the sea. It's a scary place. The sea is also symbolic of God's judgment. Think about it if you're familiar with the story of the exodus of God's people being released out of slavery in Egypt and being sent to the promised land. The last, the full, the final judgment upon Pharaoh and upon the armies of Egypt. What was it? It was the sea crashing down in God's final act of judgment. And then there's this darkness, not being able to see not being in control, not knowing what lies out there. And so Jesus is saying, let's get in the boat in the middle of the night, in the dark, get on the, uh, on the sea, on this lake, and go over there. And that, in a nutshell, is really descriptive of the life of a follower of Jesus, isn't it? Jesus says, get on this boat, this thing called faith in me, trust in me, believe in me, get on this boat, and let's go, come on, let's get on the water, in the dark, and we'll go over there. And you're going, I can't see over there. Like, what's over there? Do I really want to go over there? And Jesus is saying, come on, get on the boat, go with me, let's go over there. I, I don't know what's over there, I don't know what's lurking beneath the water. And Jesus is saying, I, I know, come on, let's go. That's the life of a follower of Christ. And just then, when things didn't appear like it could get any scarier, guess what? It got scarier, actually. It got downright terrifying. You see, there was a storm. Now, I always thought, and I think this is from the children's Bible that I had when I was a little bitty kid. Uh, I always thought that the boat that Jesus and his disciples were on were like a glorified rowboat. Have you, have you had this image in your mind? Six disciples on one side, six disciples on the other side. They all had an oar. And Jesus is kind of like curled up in the fetal position in the back because it's like this rowboat. They're trying to, but that's not what it is. Archaeologists, actually somebody told me between services, and I promised I would give credit where credit is due. An archaeologist from Texas A&M University, um, so, go gig them, Aggies. Uh, unearthed a, a fishing vessel from the first century near the Sea of Galilee. 
And it's actually bigger than I thought it was. It was the, the, those boats are about 27 feet long and about 7 feet wide. They're pretty stable. They're pretty sturdy. And they have to be stable and they have to be sturdy because wind and waves were not unusual occurrences on the Sea of Galilee given where it was located. And the text tells us that a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat and the boat was filling up with water and panic resulted. Now, think about this for just a second. We know that at least four of the occupants of this boat were professional fishermen. They made their living on that particular body of water. They'd been in the middle of it before. They had experienced storms on it before. But even they believe that this is different from anything they had experienced. This is a different one. Even they think that they are going to die. It was serious. But there's one person on that boat who's not afraid. Mark tells us that Jesus was in the stern. He was in the back of the boat asleep on a cushion. I absolutely love this image. It's a crazy but beautiful image. Now, this is not, I mean, it's a biggish boat. It's sturdy, but it's not a luxury yacht. Jesus is not below deck in the presidential suite, curled up under the covers. He's back there in the boat, stretched out, but he's exposed to the elements. The wind's howling around him. The waves are crashing. The boat's filling up with water. He's getting wet. He's probably snoring. He's breathing water in his mouth. He's spitting it out, you know, all of these kinds of things. His clothes are getting wet. His hair and his beard's getting, you know, you know, soaked with water. And the boat's going up and down. And all the other guys are probably throwing up over the side. And, and Jesus is asleep, you know, utterly spent utterly, completely exhausted. Now we know that Jesus was a man, we know that he slept, but this is interesting because this is the only time in any of the Gospels that one of the Gospel writers explicitly says Jesus was asleep. And it's no accident. Chaos is swirling all around him. Our Savior sleeps. And the disciples don't marvel at this. They don't look at Jesus and go, huh, interesting. How does he sleep through this? You know, or I can't believe he's still asleep. The disi- and, and the disciples don't wake him up and ask him to help. They don't wake him up and say, Jesus, wake up, grab a bucket, start bailing. Jesus, wake up, grab an oar. We got to get going here. Jesus, wake up and pray. You seem to have this particular relationship with God. You know, Jesus, wake up and do something. This is what they say. Don't you care? Isn't that weird? Jesus, wake up! Don't you care that we're perishing? What's the implication here? Jesus, if you cared about what we are going through, you would be doing something different than you are doing now. That's what they're saying. If you cared about what we were going through, you would be doing something different than what you are doing Now, you've been there, haven't you? Jesus, my children are struggling. They're they're this close to coming off the rails. Don't you care? Jesus, my body's betraying me. Don't you care? Jesus, the world, the world, and my world looks like it's crumbling all around me. And there's not much, I can't, I can't, I'm out of control, I'm scared, I can't do anything about it. Don't you care? Why are you asleep, Jesus? Don't you care? If you're there, if you really love me, you would be doing something different than you're doing right now. That's what we feel. That's what we often express because we want to see the other side of the lake. We want to be in control. We want to see what's under the water. We want to see what's on the other side. And when we feel out of control, we get deathly afraid. And so we come to the conclusion that because we're out of control, because our lives are out of control, therefore God's out of control. Or he doesn't care. But there's more to this story. Because Jesus does wake up. And when he wakes up, he speaks. He speaks to the wind and the waves. And then he speaks to the disciples. To the storm, he says, peace, be still. 
yes, I care that you're perishing. I care. But the next thing you know, absolute silence. Now, this is really interesting because if you took physics in high school, you would know that this doesn't happen, right? If you took a bucket of water, I, I, you go ahead and try this this afternoon. Take a bucket of water, fill it up, stick your arm in it, and swirl it around, right? And then stop swirling it and pull your arm out. Do you think that water is immediately going to still? It's immediately going to stop? It's going to immediately stop its swirling? It doesn't work that way. Hydraulics, the physics of the motion of water, it will keep going. But here, Jesus speaks to the wind and the waves, and boom, on a dime. The wind stops blowing, the waves stop crashing, the water is completely still. Something that would have taken several hours to happen if a storm had just passed. This is a miracle. This is actually definitionally a miracle. A miracle is when something happens outside of the normal course of the laws of nature because the creator and the sustainer of the normal course of the laws of nature makes it happen. And what's interesting about this is that the text doesn't tell us what the disciples actually expected to happen you know, when they were trying to wake Jesus up, it doesn't tell us why they were trying to wake him up or what they expected to happen, but it does tell us this. Out of any of the things that they could have thought were about to happen right there, this is not one of them. This is not one of them. Because as afraid as they were when they thought they were going to die, when the wind stopped howling and the waves stopped crashing and they looked down in, on the water of the lake with the moon and they couldn't even see a ripple in the, moon, in, in, in the water, that's when they got afraid. They got afraid because Jesus just blew up everything that they know to be true about the world and to be true about human beings. What we know to be true about the world is that this sort of thing doesn't happen. This is impossible. We know that to be true, right? And what we know about Jesus, or what they thought they knew about Jesus, was that no human being could cause that to happen. And so they were right and they were wrong. They were right in that no human being, no mere human being, could cause that to happen, but they were wrong in their assumption that such a thing could not happen. And so in that moment, mouth agape, this what in the world is going on here look in their eyes, Jesus breaks the silence with two questions. Why are you so afraid? We just talked about that. And do you still have no faith? Have you still no faith? That's the second question. We want sometimes Jesus to show up. We call out for him. Jesus, come. Jesus, show up. Jesus, be, be, be here. But here's the thing. Sometimes we pray to him that way, and we need to be prepared when he actually does show up. We need to be prepared for what he is going to say and what he's going to do. And what Jesus is saying here is this. Faith is the antidote to fear. We often think that the opposite of fear is bravery. That's not true. Bravery is doing something even when you're afraid. And we often think that the opposite of faith is doubt. But what Jesus is saying here is that the opposite of faith manifest in our lives is fear. And the antidote to fear is faith. This isn't isolated to this story. In the very next chapter, Mark tells us when Jairus' daughter dies, and it seems like it's too late for Jesus to do anything about it, and Jairus says, Jesus, it's too late, she's already dead. Jesus looks at him and says, do not fear, only believe. That's a weird thing to say, isn't it, in that moment? Do not fear, only believe. So what is this thing called faith, and how is it the antidote to fear? We have to be careful here to define these terms correctly because it's easy to miss the point. Culturally, our culture believes that faith is just believing that something good is going to happen strong enough and hard enough and that it will happen, right? Like, if I just have faith that things are going to get better, things are going to get better. Christians sometimes believe that faith is on a scale of like 1 to 10. And if you have low faith, bad things are going to happen to you. But if you have really high faith, good things are going to be happening to you. Right? Like, like a lot of Christians would say, 
would think that Jesus would, would wake up from his nap here on this boat and say, guys, disciples, Peter, Thomas, your faith is at a two. I, I can't work under these conditions. You know, I need your faith at a ten. I don't even get up in the morning if your faith is not at an eight, right? You guys crank it up. And then I'll show up and do something. That's really what we believe that God does. But that is not the case. It has nothing to do with the amount of faith. It's the object of our faith that is important. All Jesus is saying is this. I'm here in the boat with you. I'm here in the boat with you. And that's it. Do you see the power of this story? You see, Jesus Jesus in in, in saying what he said, Have you still no, why do you fear, have you still no faith, means that they should not have been in fear while the storm was going on. It wasn't like, it wasn't contingent, their lack of fear, Jesus is saying, is not contingent upon him stopping the storm. He's saying, in the midst of the storm, why are you afraid? Why do you still fear, feel fear? Jesus is with us. We can walk into the world without fear. The problem is that we don't live this way, do we? We don't live this way. There's so many examples of this in our lives. You know, social media is essentially a a media driven by fear, even as utilized by those who follow Christ. It's so much about fear. I I read a review, maybe about a year ago, I read a review of, of this book, this Rachel Hollis book, uh, Girl, Wash Your Face. Have you all heard of that? But I think she has a sequel to it. I, I read this review in BuzzFeed, which is really weird because I don't think BuzzFeed is generally known as a, a place that you would go for nuanced cultural critique. But in this case, it was actually good. And th- there was, it was a review of this book, Girl, Wash Your Face. And without going into details of why it's problematic that this book is called Christian Literature, the reviewer pointed to something that was in, in, in a part of that book that's also endemic in, 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 as a cultural phenomenon, uh, particularly as it's displayed in social media. And she called it, and I don't know if she made this term up or if she borrowed it from someone else, but I'm never going to forget it. It lodged in my brain. She called this cultural phenomenon curated imperfection. Curated imperfection. Curated imperfection is the Instagram post or the blog post that tells you something like this. Oh my goodness, my life is a complete mess. Oh my goodness, my life is a wreck. Just look at me. But then you do look, and you look at the picture, and what you see is a carefully staged mess, right? You see a carefully staged mess that makes you jealous of this person's life who just told you that their life is a mess. Why? Because it's a picture of them sitting on an unmade bed, with all of their children still in their pajamas and their children's books thrown about the bed. There's a large latte sitting on the table. You know, it's messy, but their hair's done. There's makeup on, miraculously enough. You know, it's like that. You know, it, 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 it's messy. And then the caption on the bottom of it says, could my life be any more crazy? Right? But you see what this is. This is, a, this is somebody saying, I'm a mess. But I'm only showing you the part of the mess that I want you to see. I'm showing you the part of the mess of my life that also tells you that I'm a good mom. Because even though my bed's not made, look at all these children's books that are scattered around here. Look at what we're reading, you know. I'm only going to show you the part of the life of my mess that tells you I still get my exercise in. Even with a toddler hanging off my neck, I'm still getting it in. Or a picture of the kitchen that's got flour on the, you know, on the kitchen and things thrown about. Look at how messy my life is, but I still cook like that for my family. Right? Curated imperfection. I'll never show you the real mess. Why? Fear. I have to utilize social media to validate my existence. Or the other side of the coin is I have to utilize social media to invalidate your existence. Hey, you that I don't know. I don't like your comment. You're a moron. 
who just used a stupid non sequitur that is self-defeating. And I don't even know what that means. And they probably didn't either when they said it. Right? Fear. 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 So much of our parenting is about fear. It starts early. Oh my goodness. He didn't roll over. And, and two streets away, he rolled over. Is he going to play for the Texans? The answer to that is no. But it doesn't matter. And it goes from there. Mama bear and helicopter sports dad are all about fear. I know I have been there, right? What happens in your heart when your child gets that teacher? Mama bear. Right? What happens when your child doesn't make the team? Doesn't get invited to the birthday party? Fear, fear, fear. Seems obvious that the entire political culture in a country right now is completely governed by fear. Fear of loss of power, fear of loss of cultural influence, fearing immigrants, refugees, but also fearing the ethical moral standards, any ethical moral standards, anything that would impinge whatsoever on the unassailable idol of my personal freedom to do whatever it is that I want to do. I'm going to attack if I feel like that is impinged upon. Why? Because I fear it being taken away from me. Fear. And here's a secret. So much of ministry can be about fear too. I thought about that a lot this week. And, 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 and you know, there's a difference between making a mistake and making a decision that doesn't play out the way that you want it to or the way that you hope it will. There's a difference between that and decisions that you actually regret. And I have realized that in my life of ministry that any time, any decision that I have made when I would like to go back and say, I really, God, would love a do-over. I'd love a mulligan here. Do I get a mulligan, you know, on this decision, on something that I really regret? Every single time that has happened, that decision had been made out of fear. Fear of controversy. I really don't have the energy to deal with what this is going to make me deal with for the next month. So I'm just going to ignore it and sweep it under the rug. Fear of people leaving the church. Hmm, if I say this and I do that, well, you know, we may have a mass exodus. Fear of people speaking badly about me, either, you know, to one another or on social media. Fear of, of looking silly in my neighborhood. There, there are times when I walk through life in my neighborhood where I kind of just, I feel like I just want to be like the normal guy and I don't want to be the pastor guy. Why? Because it's fear. It's fear of, 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 of the consistency of representing Jesus in my life. It's pervasive. So what's the solution? This is the beauty of this passage. And this is what I don't want you to miss. Jesus does not say that the, the solution to your fear is to suck it up. He doesn't say that. Suck it up, guys. Grab your oars and row. Just deal with it. Be brave. Be strong. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps and just keep plugging away. Now, he says the solution is, is faith. And faith means this. Faith means the certainty that Jesus is with you in the boat. You see, that's why he told them that they should have actually had faith and not feared even before the storm was calmed. Have you still no faith? I'm here. And this is important because faith does not mean that Jesus is always going to remove you from the circumstance that you are in. That's not what he means. You may still walk through the valley. But faith means that when you walk through the valley, he is walking with you. You are not alone. You are never alone. And because he walks with you, you can bear it. You can walk. You can live. You can bear witness to him in this world without fear through faith. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you are with us in all things. We pray that by your grace we would walk through this world with faith, with not fear. In Jesus' name, amen.